you have heard it said that the pen is mightier than the sword. But if I'm in a street fight, give me the sword. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> You've heard it said the customer is always right. Anybody here ever worked in hospitality or retail fields? <laughs> You're rolling your eyes right now. I know you are. You have heard it said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, the person who said that must have never gone to middle school, because <laughs> I still remember some words from middle school that did hurt, so apparently that can happen. You have heard it said, you are what you eat. So I just need to ask you, do I look like a never-ending pasta bowl today? <laughs> because I have had a lot of pasta this week. I love pasta. We had it for leftovers. We had it in the restaurant. We, yeah, it's been a good pasta week for me. So I guess I am what I eat. You have heard it said, a watched pot never boils. Yes, it does. It just, it just takes a long time. A really, really, really long time. You have heard it said, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. But listen, we're busy. Who has time to, to measure the greenness of each grass on each side. And finally, you have heard it said, slow and steady wins the race. Unless, of course, it's a 100-meter dash, then I suggest a sprint. <laughs> slow and steady will not win that race, I'm thinking. Would you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48? And we are continuing on in our series. It's a series from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teachings about life, life in the kingdom of God. And, and we're in a little mini-series within the Sermon on the Mount right now called Next Level Relationships. So learning about what God says about relationships. And throughout this, this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' really long teaching, he has clarified and then intensified all of the Old Testament laws, the law of Moses. So you might be familiar with the Ten Commandments, things like, you shall not kill. Well, Jesus said, you've heard that law, but I'm coming to tell you, it's a, that is a pretty low bar. And so Jesus said, not only should you not kill, but also don't even be angry with each other because that leads to bad stuff. So Jesus clarified what, what was the, God's intention behind all of those commands and all of those laws. And then he bumped that up a notch and said, hey, let's go beyond just not killing people, for example. And let's not be angry with each other because that, that it starts, a, starts a bad thing going. And as he clarified all these laws and commandments, he just kept driving them towards one goal. It's a four-letter word. You know what it is? Love. Love. And he said, really, there's all these commands, all this stuff in the Old Testament, and it all boils down to one thing, love. Love God and love your neighbor. That's it. Love God, love your neighbor. You do that, you have, you have done God's will. And that's, that's pretty amazing, pretty simple uh, in terms of what all needs to be done, but it's sometimes challenging to actually do it. So let's go into, into God's word. Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, you have heard the law that says, and in uh, several of the other uh, uh, English translations, it says, you have heard it said, all right, so you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor. I'm going to stop right there. Love your neighbor is a key, key verse for Jesus and for his ministry, for his teaching. It comes from the Old Testament book, Leviticus 1918. It's the book of laws. And right there in the middle of it is love your neighbor. And Jesus repeated this command, he lived out this command, he clarified it, taught on it, adopted it. Love is central in Jesus' teaching and for us. Love is central in Jesus' life by example. And love is central in the kingdom of God. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus said, in fact, the whole biggest part of the Bible, the whole Old Testament, hangs on just two things. The whole, all these bazillion commands and stories. It hangs really on two things. Love God and love your neighbor. So important. And when you love your neighbor, you fulfill all of God's will about relationships. It's so simple. Three words. Love your neighbor. Just do it. 
Just do it. <laughs> Love your neighbor, and you fulfilled the whole thing. Going back into that same verse, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay, so now there are 613 laws in, or commands in the Old Testament. Love, love your neighbor. We already talked about that one. That's Leviticus 19.18. Hate your enemy. That's not a law. That's not from the Bible. So he said, you've heard it said, love your, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You know who was saying that? <laughs> the Jewish rabbis, the, 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 the teachers of the law had collected a bunch of sayings and rulings on the law, trying to explain how to live it out. And the, they, they had written volumes, books and books and books, on how to live out the law. And the, the collection of all those writings is called a halakha, something like that. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. Uh, but it, it, it basically boils down to the way to behave. So God says, you shall not kill. And the rabbis would say, so you can do this, you cannot do that. Or the law says, honor the Sabbath. And the rabbis say, well, you can walk you know, a quarter mile, but not, not a third of a mile. They, they, said how, they said how to do it. And all of those writings together uh, uh, became this, this, bo this body of teaching, all these traditions of men that Jesus talks about in other places. And Jesus, in other places, says, you guys are so missing it. You're saying, well, as long as I hold this minimum standard, I can treat my parents any way I want. And Jesus said, no, you're, you're missing it. And so Jesus is referring to some of those teachings where they would say, well, as long as you're loving your neighbor, do what you want with your enemy. It had come to that. And Jesus is going, whoa, time out. That is not God's intention for the law at all. The Jewish people were God's chosen people. God said, I got to start somewhere. He started with the Jews, with the family of Abraham. And Jesus even was born a Jew. So he, he, the, the Jews, they, they knew that the Bible was through the Jews. Salvation was through the Jews. I mean, they, they figured they've got it going on. And many Jews in Jesus' day and up to that point had a tendency to get in this us versus them mindset. So we're the holy ones, we're the chosen ones, everyone else is not. All the non-Jews, all the Gentiles, they were often excluded from the worship community. So you can come in the lobby, but not in the worship center, like that kind of a feel. They were labeled as others. There's God's people and then others. They were treated as unclean or inferior, and BT dubs, that's what I am. I'm a Gentile. We are Gentiles, many of us in this room, maybe not all, but many of us. Uh, that, that's who we're talking about, us. Uh, but to the, to the Jews of Jesus' day, we were them. And so it was not a very, a very big step to be not going from us to them to us and enemies. And they, they really had a very, uh, very visible enemy to kind of focus on, and that was the Roman Empire, who had come in and occupied Israel. So they were really the ones that were, uh, that were um, keeping their thumb on Israel in Jesus' day. And so they were called, there was, a little, there was a little code word that they would use that meant enemies, and it referred to the Roman Empire. That, uh, so the Jews were very much in this mindset that my neighbors are the Jews. And many of them would take it another level higher and say, and not only that, they are the Jews who look like me and think like me. There were camps even within Israel, camps of thinking. And so it became this, this in environment where it was, if you look and think like me, you're my friend. Otherwise, you are my enemy, and I am not responsible to love you. It was so easy to do back then, and it's easy to do today. To love those whom you like and hate those you don't like. Even David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, who was a great king of Israel, in Psalm 139, he wrote, I hate those who hate you, Lord. I count them my enemies. And Jesus is coming today and said, we're going to change that mindset, people. Matthew 5.44, Jesus said, but I say... Love your enemies. 
Pray for those who persecute you. It's really the same command stated twice. His, his audience considered Jews like themselves their neighbors, and Rome was the enemy, and Rome was actually persecuting them, actually beating them, mistreating them, and persecuting them. So Jesus replaces the whole law, the prophets, the whole Old Testament, all the halakha, all the rabbis' teachings, all their traditions with a new, very radical way to live. Love your enemies. Now for us, you know, uh, where we are in our country, you may be watching around the world, where we are, we're we're really pretty free from persecution. There are, there's, you know, there's, um, written persecution out there, maybe some verbal persecution at times, but you know, these guys were being persecuted. So can you imagine having Jesus say, love your enemies. Love that person who beat you with a stick yesterday. Love your enemies. This is, this is radical. And he said, love your persecutors at least by praying for them, at least, at the minimum, pray for them. Who among us can do this on our own power? Who who has the power to just truly love everyone who's beating you down or hurting your family? In uh, in verse 45, Jesus goes on and he bases his new command on God's universal love for every person in the world. Verse 45, he says, in that way, so when you love your enemy and you pray for those who persecute you, in that way, You will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Everybody. Everybody gets God's sun. Everybody gets God's rain. God gives us the sunlight that we need for warmth, for seeing clearly, for growth. And he gives us the rain that we need for refreshing drinking water and and water for our crops. I think some people might look at this and say, oh, God gives good and bad to everybody alike. That's not what he's saying. He gives good and good to everybody. Rain is good, people. (laughs) Rain is good. That's why the Northwest is green, because of rain. That's why we have water to drink, because of rain. So Jesus was saying God gives all of his good stuff to everybody, the evil and the good, the just and the unjust people. In verse 46, Jesus said, and he kind, of, he kind of expands on it and just teaches you a little bit here. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? I mean, even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're, only, if you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans, even people that he was saying are far from God do that. So Jesus pushes back hard against the mindset that says, I love only those who look like me and think like me. Man, this is for today. People, this is for today. It's for me. It's for you. Jesus has been to heaven. This is what is, what is just so amazing uh, about this. He came from heaven to earth. And he saw what perfection looked like in relationships, in love, in worship of the Lord. He saw all that. And so he comes to earth, and he looks around, and he goes, wow, this is not like that. (laughs) And he says, we got to fix this. And it's really cool because he's not just thinking up a cool philosophy to live. He's not just going, here's some cool ideas. He is just so driven by, I've seen heaven And it needs to be heaven on earth. And so when he describes relationships and he describes loving one another, he's he's describing what he's seen and what he's experienced. He's not like it would be neat if this happened. He's like, it happens and it's, it's beyond what you could ever imagine. It's what God intended for the planet was that we would love each other. Wow. So he invites us, you and me, to participate in the kingdom of heaven now, right here on earth. And it's, it's not going to be complete now, but it has begun. It's going to be complete one day. We're standing face to face with him. And Jesus totally redefines who your neighbor is. And I don't have time to get into it today, but there's another place where the guy said, love God, love people. Jesus said, you're right. And the guy goes, 
who's my neighbor? And Jesus had to go into him and, and, and just talk about who, who's your neighbor. Well, your neighbor is whoever you run into. That's who your neighbor is, whoever you interact with in your life. Anyone you have some kind of relationship with, if they're in the same city as you, they're your neighbor. If they're in your city government or police force, they are your neighbor. If, if they are uh, someone in your county, they are your neighbor. You know, you may not have an opportunity to, to love someone across the, the world, but you do have opportunities to love and affect the people that are your actual neighbors, you know, within your county, even if you think of it that, and that small. And so Jesus wraps it all up with a simple command, verse 48. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay, so again, Jesus has been there. He's seen the perfect Father. He's talked with him. He sat beside him. And he knows what perfection is. And he comes and says to all of us broken, sinful people, be perfect. Yeah, that's it. Just, just like God the Father is perfect, be that perfect. So Jesus said in this passage, when you take this little passage that I've gone through today, love your enemies, be perfect. So it's in context. The context is not do your hair perfectly, like not do everything perfect. That's not the context. The context is love your neighbor perfectly. What does perfect mean? Not quite the same as what we say perfectionist today. Perfect means mature complete, lacking nothing. So Jesus is saying, let your love for your neighbor, let your love for the people around you be perfect. Let it be complete. Let it be full. Let, let it be abundant. And, and that is perfect. You might be tempted to think, well, it doesn't seem reasonable. It doesn't seem logical. It doesn't seem right that Jesus would expect me to love someone who acts like she hates me. That's not reasonable. Or you might think, well, I need to protect myself. If someone's persecuting me, so, you know, I can't let myself be vulnerable to my enemies. It's just self-defense. You might think to yourself, well, no one's perfect, so Jesus must be speaking in hyperbole. That's, you know, exaggeration. exaggeration. Is that what's going on here? Jesus has been building a case. So as God loves the whole world, and as God blesses the just and unjust, the evil and the good, Jesus' followers are to do that. They are to bless and love everybody, good or bad, it doesn't matter. Jesus' followers are to be perfect in love. Perfection is to treat everyone as your neighbor by loving them. Perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love eliminates all hostility, friction, strife, division. So you can see in our land, in our day, we got a ways to go to, before we get to perfect love. Not quite there yet. Perfect love fosters unity. Perfect love repairs broken relationships and it multiplies your friends. The bottom line of this message is this. Love and prayer can turn your enemies into allies. Love and prayer can turn your enemies into allies. And wouldn't you rather have more allies and fewer enemies? That sounds awesome. I'm, sign me up. Yes, I would like that. That is fantastic. I want to close today with a penetrating question that I have been wrestling about, wrestling over uh, in, the, in the preparing of this message this week. Who is your enemy? Who is your enemy? The first step to being able to obey Jesus' command that we've heard today is to identify your enemy and to confess your enemy to God. Scott McKnight pointed out that sometimes we love our neighbors in a way that simultaneously condemns our enemies. Sometimes we love our neighbors in a way that simultaneously at the same time condemns other people in the socially acceptable form of exclusion, denunciation, libel, slander. And I encourage you to invest a little bit of time today, like right now or later today or this, this week, 
to just identify your enemies. And at first blush, you might think, I don't have any enemies. Well, let me just prompt you with a couple questions here. Have you ever felt ashamed when someone walked into the room because you had just been talking bad about them? Do you avoid certain places because it's possible that so-and-so is going to show up there? He goes there, she goes there. Are you ever afraid of someone or judgmental towards someone whose skin looks different than yours or who dresses differently than you do or who lives a different lifestyle than you do? How do you feel about the other presidential candidate? Whichever way you voted. How do you feel about liberals or conservatives in general? Have they become your enemies? Who is that specific person that uh, maybe in, in your life that, that person just rubs you the wrong way or gets your blood boiling? Who abandoned you? Who criticizes you? Who ignores you? Or thinking of it the other way, who seems inferior to you? Who are you jealous of? If you're not loving them, then you're treating them as an enemy. So it's possible we have more enemies than we realize. Now, go love your enemies. Love them the way that God loves you. Turn your enemies into neighbors. Turn your enemies into neighbors. And let's make sure where the, where the bar is. Don't just avoid fighting what did Jesus do to his enemies? He invited them to his table. And in his day, a table was a low-lying table on the ground where everyone's just uh, reclining on the ground to eat uh, around pillows. So, like, he brought people that were his enemies, supposedly, and ate dinner with them. And he, he actually took a lot of flack for that because he loved his enemies who uh, people would have said are his enemies. Go beyond tolerating to actually working for their good. Advocate for him or her. Have their back when others are putting them down. I had an opportunity to do that this week. I messed up a lot, a lot this week, but that was one. Maybe it's because I knew this was coming. Like, I better, I better do this right. <laughs> if you can't do any of that, at the very minimum, pray for your enemies. You will be surprised what happens to your enemy and what happens to your heart when you pray for them. And I'm not talking about, oh, Lord, bless them and then move on to pray for your own self. I'm talking about, Lord, help them. Let their mind be sharp. Let their body be healthy. Triple their bank account, Lord. Bless their family. Bless their kids. Bless their marriages. May they get a promotion to, like that kind of prayer for your enemies. And as I asked before, who of us could possibly love like that? It's so unnatural. It's not how we naturally act and think. Well, Jesus did. He showed us how. Jesus showed love for his enemies. You know what he did in his inner group of 12? He invited Matthew, who was a corrupt Jewish tax collector collecting taxes for the Romans and pocketing a little something on the side for himself. And Jesus brought him in to his inner circle, and he ate at the table with Matthew and all of his corrupt friends when Matthew brought them together. On the cross, Jesus forgave, and he prayed for the people who had just nailed his arms, his hands to the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Like he, he didn't just say, bless them. I mean, he was like, God, forgive them for this horrible thing that they have just done to me. So rest in Jesus' love for you. Flow in Jesus' love for all humanity. You can love others with the love that Jesus has for you. That's where you get the love. It's from him. Love and prayer can turn your enemies into allies. So what will you do 
to make your neighbors, I'm sorry, your enemies your neighbors? What will you do to make your enemies your neighbors? If you're in the room, would you stand with me and let's pray. And if you're online, would you get yourself in a, just a place of prayer? And we need to pray about this. We need to talk about this. This is radical. This is hard. This is, this is simple, but it is not easy. So would you bow your heads with me online, bow your heads, in the room, bow your heads. Let, let's pray. Lord, we just confess. We, we've heard what you said, and we don't want to do it. Not naturally. So I ask you, Lord, to give us the want to. Give us the love. You have already showered your love, your, your affection, your forgiveness on us, Lord God. Help us to, to, to focus on that and just actually to become a conduit for your love to get to other people. Lord, I pray that you would help us to love those who think or look differently than us. That's what you've commanded us to do. In fact, it's your central thing. So help us to do that, Lord. Help me to do that. Help us, Lord God. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, if you're in the room, do you today, are you willing to ask God to help you love your so-called enemies? Are you willing to identify them and to love them? If so, would you raise your hand? And I just want to pray for you because this is hard. And online, would you raise your hand, raise it to God? I may not be able to see, but he can. And there's something about a willing heart with an upraised hand. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Would I ask you to help us, Lord? We live in a world where it almost seems cool to be divided and hateful. It seems trendy. It seems what everyone's doing. And Lord Jesus, here we are raising our hands to say, okay, I know 7 billion others are doing it a different way, but I'm going to do it your way. Wow. Lord, this is such a powerful moment. I pray right now, Lord God, that walls would come down. Lord God, I pray that our hearts would be softened. Lord, that we would be a part of the kingdom of God, fully functional loving our neighbor as ourselves, as you have commanded us to do with the love that you have given us. Oh, Lord, pour your love through us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for a, just a revolution to happen that begins right now in this moment, in this place. Lord, I just picture the, the kind of, of ripple effects that happen when a, when a stone is dropped in a still pond. And there's just ripple effects that go far-reaching and they just go on and on and on. Lord, I pray for that kind of a thing to happen right now in my heart, in our hearts, Lord God. That, Lord, we don't care what everyone else is doing. We're going to love. We're going to love our enemies. We're going to love that person that we've had a wall up against. We're going to love that person we're afraid of. We're going to love that person we disagree with. We're going to love that person that we look different than. The way that you do. The way that you love them. And Lord, I pray that the ripple effects, wow, 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 wow. I can't even see the ripple effects that are going to happen from this prayer right now. I can't see it yet. Lord, I pray that our hearts change. I pray that, that uh, another ripple effect is that relationships are repaired and restored. I pray that another ripple effect is that unity happens. Uh, I pray that another, another ripple effect is that people get saved. People put their faith in Jesus in our workplace, in our family, because we have decided to love. And now, Lord, I know that you are greater, but I also know we have an enemy, and he saw our hands go up. So I, I just know, Lord, that within minutes, hours, or days, this is going to be tested. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to pass that test. Help us to love our enemy and make him a neighbor. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, 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 wow. Your light is being released in us right now. Your truth, your way, your kingdom. 
kingdom of God is coming now. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Would you stay in an attitude of prayer, though, with your head still bowed? I want to just ask you, have you entered the kingdom of God? That sounds really lofty. But what I mean is, have you put your faith in Jesus? Are you his follower? Are you his apprentice? I want to invite you to do that. I don't know where, you know, where your heart is. I don't know where your life trajectory is. I don't know where you've come from. But I know this. I want to invite you to follow Jesus, to put your faith in him. What does that mean? That means trusting him, not your own goodness, for eternal life. We're all sinners, so we need a Savior. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. Just, just start there. Start there. And in the room, if you would like to make that decision today, would you just shoot your hand up like we do? I, 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 just to say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to make a decision today to, to put my faith in Jesus. Yep, I see that hand. That's awesome. Yep, and I see that hand. I see that hand. That's great. I love it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yep, I see that. Man, there's, there's a lot going on today. God is doing powerful things. Online, would you raise your hand to God? And I would love to just coach you all in a prayer. Uh, don't pray it to me. Pray it to God. But I'm just going to uh, feed you the words just to kind of get you started. And then you can just take off from there. Would you repeat after me? Everybody, let's help them out. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we just say, great. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Let's follow Jesus. Amen. And if you just made that decision, whether you're in the room or online, would you just text the word restart? Because you just restarted your life spiritually. Would you text restart to the phone number 97,000? We'll shoot you a text right back just to encourage you and uh, just encourage you to take your next steps. Man, this is, God's doing something, you guys. God is doing something today. Woo, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Wow. Wow. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus wouldn't have said it if it wasn't possible. And I love how being perfect is tied with loving your enemies. Man. So that was powerful. Thank you, Pastor Garen. If you're new with us today, text GREET to 97000. And this just allows us to meet you, greet you, welcome you to our church family. We just love that you're here. And we want to know that, um, we want you to know that we are happy that you're here today. So, and if you're watching online, if you could subscribe to our channel and like our videos, this helps um, those videos get out to more and more people. And what I like to do, um, even when I'm not online, is go in and like the video because that just helps. So um, you can do that even if you're here in the room today. Um, right after the service, Connect Groups is starting. So don't go anywhere. Join a Connect Group. You don't even have to sign up. Just show up. We want you to be a part because we know how valuable it is for you. And I just look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday here in person and online right here at 1030. Have a great week. Bye.